<laughs> Welcome everyone to episode seven of Ask the Boss. Um, thanks again for all your support, not only for this segment, all but also for the club. Um, special guest today, joined by Brett Kamali. Welcome, Brett. Justin, how are we? I'm very well, thank you. Would you like me to refer to you as Noddy throughout the interview? Well, a lot of people don't call me by Brett. Okay. I get in trouble at home, I get called Brett. Or if I don't listen to Noddy, they, my children or partner then says Brett. So, okay. normally so, to, so call me Noddy. Noddy it is. Yeah. So obviously exciting times for you yep. and also the club. Um, some recent signings. Um, do you want to tell me where the NRLW is at and what it means to you? to be coaching the NRLW side this year? Uh, really excited. Really, really excited for the opportunity um, to become our inaugural coach for the NRLW. Um, you know, obviously been in this club now for a short amount of time. Um, I mean, different roles in that short amount of time. But yeah, I love coaching. Um, you know, I had a little time out of coaching for, for some personal reasons and then sort of come back in the last few years into coaching. Uh, coached our Hobby Norman women's side last year, which was really, really exciting. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Um, they sweat on every word you say. Um, they want to get better. Uh, and obviously in that time process, there was our application for the NRLW licence. Um, so then the excitement that, that this whole club and all, I think all of Western Sydney was was joined by with the fact that we got an NRLW licence. So uh, I'm excited. Uh, I've been a part of one inaugural club. Um, obviously, you know, First year at the Melbourne Storm, if I think back to my time there, that was a set-up club that was in an inaugural team to be a part of that, to create the culture, to create the standards, to the style of football and be a part of all that. I'm really, really excited about. Um, it's not coming in and taking over someone else. It's not coming in and only being able to have one or two players. It's literally creating the whole blueprint from the start. So we do the whole recruitment decisions, policies, uh, obviously with the – Recruitment committee with the support of you, of you guys at, here at the club and the board. Um, it's been a exciting time. It's been a challenging time. Um, had a little bit of anxiety. I was the first time I've gone through trying to recruit players and make sure they're a part of your team. Um, it's a big decision. The, the the couple of big gets we got the other last week was huge for us as a club, I believe. Um, but until they say yes, your fingers crossed, legs crossed, everything crossed, and hope that they come. So, um, it, yeah, it's exciting times. I think. Um you know, a lot of people have opinions on recruitment and, you know, you're going to get people to be happy with some decisions yeah. and other decisions, you know, they're entitled to an opinion and sometimes they're not happy. Yeah. The process uh, now being involved in it, it's far more complicated and complex than possibly what you thought as a, definitely as a player, but also in other roles you've had. Yeah, as a player, I think you just think about, you know, that guy's a good player. Why, why isn't he playing with us or what can he do? And if you're short of forward, you go and buy a forward, you're short of back. Obviously now, you know, I've been 13 years retired now, so I've sat across just about every job that there is in rugby league, uh, in football land. So it's it's obviously interesting, as you said, I was a part of some, you know, recruitment committee procedures last year, different roles I've had with different clubs I think you've been a part of. But now you physically sit there and go, you know, player one to 24 and our 24 player roster, what's important for the NRLW uh, you know, I, I treat it like it's rugby league because it is rugby league. It's not a, there's a women's game and there's a men's game, but it's effectively it's playing Absolutely. rugby league. So uh, I've watched with interest the last few years, uh, especially more probably more interest the last 12 months, um, knowing that we were going to get a license, hopefully being a part of it. But uh, I think if you look at the premium players, they've all played five years of NRLW. So we can't expect year one people to be as good as year five people. Um, that's a part of the development uh, my role now as the coach of the club uh, is to develop our players into the prospects that we think they can turn into. Um, the facility here will allow us to train hard um, and get bigger and stronger. Um, the senior players, or those marquee players that we went out and purchased last week, uh, for those special reasons is they get to be the senior players to help the, our younger group of players develop into what we think they can be. The expectations is they'll buy into it and train really hard um, and then become as good as they can become. So it's a sort of like a double-edged sword where if we both work to the maximum we can, we'll get the best ability or the best out of every individual um, whilst creating a, a successful environment, enjoyable environment, um, you know, and, and obviously then it goes down to um, the type of player you want to have. I think in the women's game, it's obviously very, very important, probably in the men's game, um, middle forwards and fullbacks are premiums. If you look at the, the players who would probably be ranked higher, um, so probably, you know, Ray Sen McGregor last year won the Dallium. Ali Brigginshaw is a standout halfback that's now playing GC 13. So you, your key players probably need to touch the ball a lot. Um, you need to get some momentum to play off the back foot. You need to have physical forwards that stop momentum from the opposition. And 
you know, I think the, the, probably the other reason why, you know, Bo was a big part of our club is that the, our players look up to Bo as if she's an idol, um, a rock star in their eyes a little bit. But I think, you know, she's been waiting for this opportunity, but also fullbacks and premium players in the NRLW as well. So, mm. you know, they're, they're part of the reasons why we recruited some of these players and they're sort of part of the reasons why um, it's exciting. And then, you know, you the key, whilst we've had Harvey Norman for four years here is we've developed a bit of that development phase. But even over the last sort of six to eight weeks or 10 weeks, we've given every... And Harvey Norman player, one or two things that we think they can keep improving whilst playing Harvey Norman to to get closer to get that NRLW contract, um, but also know that there's a genuine connection at this club between, you know, our juniors coming into Harvey Norman that go into NRLW. So the process has been exactly the same um, as you're familiar with being obviously a part of the yeah. um, men's competition last year with recruitment where you and your recruitment team yeah. um, come to a list management committee meeting we try to have them weekly yep. um, and present the options of who you would like recruited and the reasons why um, then fair to say that that process then is about making sure that we're salary cap compliant yep. um, and also as you rightly said then having prosecuting the argument to suggest that we've got more than just one option because one option often doesn't work out as you think it would yeah, that's right. I, I think it's, you know, you go, I'd, I'd love to have gone out and bought 17 internationals that could play bits and pieces. But as you said, the, the cap's there and, and then the opportunities, you want to create your own players to get that development coming through. So having our targets, uh, we identified our targets pretty early. Um, you know, I, I suppose, you know, one of the targets we did identify, well, going back probably to 12 months ago, we had Kezi and Jess come, sir, just come and play Harvey Norman for us, who were premium players. Um, and then they obviously go off... Um, you know, we had a few others that come and played in our Harvey Norman system who were successful to win the, the competition in 2022 and they've gone off to play NRLW somewhere else and Harvey Norman now this year somewhere else. So we've spoke to a number of people. Um, probably one that we did have on our radar early was Jess Surges. Um, Jess is just a superior athlete, competitive. Um, she does things on the field that probably some other players don't do just through her want to win. Um, so she was one of the players that we looked at that we thought would be great for our our players to, to watch her train, to be around at that competitive nature. Um, and someone that we sort of had had conversations, we had ongoing conversations with Jess, um, just sort of got to a stage where we thought she wouldn't be leaving the Roosters. Um, three weeks ago, effectively watched North Sydney, um, and effectively not North Sydney, but watched Sarah Togatuki literally destroy our Harvey Norman side and watch it in person compared to watching it on video. Um, and literally within 10 minutes, it's like, we need to go and get that person. So... Sort of some recruitment decisions moved a little bit, um, but she, you know, I'd been talking to her manager for a little while, knowing that it was a potential that she might be able to get out of the Roosters. Um, she's a very proud Western Sydney girl. Um, she's strong. She's physical. She's tough. She's young. Um, you know, she's obviously won man of the match in the grand final two years ago. So, you know, you talk about quality player coming from Western Sydney, gets a chance to move back home. Um, I've only met her for the first time two weeks or three weeks ago. Um, you know, then has a you know at this not as a start of her career, but already a premium player who will help our players. Probably Kezi's on the other end of that. It's not at the start of her career, but her branding, um, her professionalism, her leadership. Um, we saw a little bit of that when she played for us, and how she'll help our the younger people develop and put grow. Whilst I think she's still one of the premium players in the competition, she'll she'll be one of our she'll be one of our back rowers. She'll help Bo in the captaincy sort of role. Um, so there's sort of those reasons why you go through those recruitment decisions. And then um, we've, you know, obviously Rakia Horn, we announced last week on Monday, on Easter Monday at the, at the footy is another person that we've attracted from outside in. So that's really, really exciting. And I think um, yeah, potentially there might be one or two or two or three more that we'll add to it. So we're pretty comfortable at the moment. I think we've got 21 of our 24 players signed, um, which is a real good thing. But I think that goes back to being organised, being planned, having a part of a recruitment committee that that he's as professional as what the men's program is um, rather than just doing your own thing and going off. And then um, obviously it's got to fit into a cap, got to fit into a budget. My next challenge is coming up with the four development players um, of, you know, 24 player roster, four development players. My mind is those four players have got to have the ability to play in case a player is injured in that position, but also having a future eye on who might play out to play NRLW next year from our Harvey Norman side. Yep. 
Um, that was a question really from Troy Maguire, who's a Platinum member, yep. who did ask the question, how are potential recruitment targets done for the NRLW, which you've answered ahead yeah. of the question. So. Sorry, buddy. I, th- I think the other thing is athletically, athleticism is huge for the game. Um, athleticism is big in the game. It's big. Um, so I think being athletic, being strong, uh, being able to pass the football, um, you know, and then obviously, you, you, you know, we'll play a brand of football. And again, going back to, sorry, Troy, that I didn't answer that first up or didn't wait for the question. There's a brand of football that I get to create for us as a as a West Tigers NRLW side, which I'm not taking someone else's style. I don't have to come in halfway through a competition and go, oh, well, just this is what's already in place. I've got to follow it. So it's it's exciting in that term. Mm. It's, you get to create your own style, brand of football. They then match your recruitment decisions. Yep. Um, and then hopefully you get lucky with injuries. So how this works, I'm no doubt you've watched this every month, but how this works just to, to make sure you are, are fully aware is that we have questions coming in from fans and members. Um, and I think you've got the first one that for me from someone. Got Tim from Campbelltown here has sent me a question to ask you, Jay, uh, Justin. So he said here, I've been watching Ask the Boss. How and why did this come about? Yeah, so the um, the motivation for this, and it's a good question because um, we uh, probably two, three years or probably even longer ago um, set up every year a members group. Yep. A members working committee uh, made up of um, passionate West Tigers members uh, ranging between eight and ten people in any given year. Uh, they would come in on a, you know, monthly basis, and we would meet with them, and we would, um, you know, talk through different ideas, uh, different ideas that they had in ways of improving the club, improving the communication, improving the delivery of game day, and all different aspects. And one of the things they suggested was that we should be do a segment like Ask the Boss and be really transparent and have people, you know, send in questions, yep. which is this format, and then we respond and have different guests on them. So. That was the motivation behind it. So it was really driven by our members um, requesting it to be done. So easy. And then last Thursday, we had the Heritage Dinner as well. What was it like to have all the West Tigers legends come together? Oh, it was awesome. Um, you know, as you walk down the, the hallway here at the Zurich Centre and to see all those legends on the wall on the right-hand side then, and then to be able to celebrate their achievements and what they've done for this club and to get us to the position, it was really um, privileged to be a part of it and certainly a great event. Talking about being a part of this, you know, great organisation. Obviously, this will be shared now with the NRLW and the NRL. So I, I know how it's going to work. And obviously, we've got separate change rooms. It's obviously a big part of what was thought about when this building was going to be built probably five years ago, mm-hmm. six years ago. I don't know how long ago the process started, but obviously, the hope was NRLW. I take our ladies through that NRLW change room. They said their name on the locker. As excited as what the males probably do do, I don't mm-hmm. know if they appreciate it as much, but... I think the ladies do appreciate it enormously. They see the facility. We're going to do weights down there. We're going to train out here on a Saturday morning um, through our off-season and start playing. So I know how it's going to be shared, but how did it become a shared facility? I know the the um, notion always, you know, four or five years ago when we first decided to really start investing in the pathways and yeah. not go for an NRLW licence, I think you saw the fruits of that last year with the success of the Harvey Norman, yeah. and you'll see that with the talent coming through, as you alluded to. Um, you know, we always wanted this to be a facility that would accommodate both men and women um, and develop and give opportunity for both both men and women to be the best athlete and version yeah. of themselves. So um, when designing it, it was um, there was no compromise. Like it had to be a shared facility for yeah. both. I just spoke before about one of my recruits, Sarah Togatuki. She spoke at our press conference about being a very passionate Western Sydney girl. Um, I know we've got a lot of our players have come from the Campbelltown region, bits and pieces. So, you know, obviously for them, it's a chance to play in RLW, but for us as a club, there's an opportunity for that centre of excellence to be funded out there at Campbelltown and, and keep growing that area. That's something I'm going to push very heavily as a coach. That we've got to be really proud about where we come from and mm. who we stand for. And, and demographically, you know, we stand for this big Western Sydney corridor. Yeah, and the... Um I'm not sure if there was a question in there, just a statement, but I'll go with the... The Centre question. of Excellence, how good's it going to be? The funding you've got for the Centre of... You get a chance here to create legacy, not only here, but out there. I think it's, it's really important. You talk about the geographical corridor, yeah. and it's a huge area, and we're really blessed to be able to have such a big area as our catchment area. Yeah. Um, and the challenge has always been to resource it appropriately, Yeah. Um, to work with the um, Campbelltown Council, who've been outstanding through this process and um, with Western Sydney University out there to be able to now have the ability to have a centre of excellence 
yeah. at Campbelltown Sports Stadium. So um, it's now just waiting for sort of the funding agreement between Campbelltown Council and state government to um, happen. Once that funding agreement happens, then the process should be quite quick in regards to planning. All the drawings are done. Yep. Um, you know, hopefully within sort of that 24 months from now, we can have a brand new centre of excellence out there that we'll be able to utilise. Very, very good. And and does that, I know it's a headache probably, or not a headache, but I know you're a busy man, but what opportunities is having an NRLW licence created for this club in corporate, in branding, in membership, and just fan fan participation? I think it's, it's going to create a lot of opportunities yeah. at the moment. Obviously, we haven't really rolled out any membership. Yeah. We've had some um, great additional support from current sponsors yeah. and we've had um, been able to attract a lot more sponsors including obviously Zurich which is yeah. you know very generously partnered with us in the Zurich Centre and also um, with the women's program so I think what we'll see will be uh, definitely an increase in participation in our catchment area which yeah. is you know the fundamental reason behind um, creating success by having that you know really big um, opportunity for people to play and participate in rugby league and then obviously as they come through the, the system and the, they get to the pinnacle being NRLW, um, that's certainly going to be added to. Uh, I think the members, once we start developing programs for specifically for NRLW or to incorporate both women and men in a membership uh, program. Um, so I think the opportunities are immense. We launched a new coterie group through yeah. the foundation a couple of weekends ago or Easter Monday. Um, so the Women's Champion Program, that's really about coming through the foundation and funding um, resources for the NRLW and the Pathways Program. So the support we had was amazing in the room. Uh, to think we raised over $100,000, you know, in half an hour of, of Easter Monday is exceptional. And to all those people that contributed, we couldn't be more thankful and appreciative of that. And it's going to certainly help you being able to resource it to the level that you need to resource it. Yeah, and, 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 you know, for me, it's a great opportunity. As we went back to the start, what does it mean to be an inaugural coach? Well, you know, I get to be in a professional organisation, create it for my own, my, my own, but then utilising all our staff here in bits and pieces to yeah. make sure that we have a successful yeah. program is the challenge and what we need to do as the next few months unfold. And we certainly are well-resourced now to continue to make it the most successful program we can. Mm. Um, a question from Paul Gibbons. Noddy, we've announced uh, three marquee players, but it seems that there's something missing can you tell us a bit more about those decisions, which you touched on, but is there anyone that you can speak to, or not maybe the person, but the positions that you're looking for to fill the last three that you spoke about? Yeah, um, I, I think at the moment we've got, um, you know, uh, middle forwards have sort of been taken care of. You know, Sarah Togatuki is a part of that position. We've, we've moved Christian Pio from the back row to the front row. Uh, you know, we've got a reasons for why we've done that. Um, we've got our own... Harvey Norman players, um, we've, we've got some of our younger players who have been fringe Harvey Norman players who have done that. Back rowers, we're probably looking for a back rower, an outside back, um, and probably uh, medically waiting for some outcomes on some players from Harvey Norman, whether it's a an extra half back or an extra dummy half that will go out and try and add to that sort of player 21 to 24 category. Um, it'll also then, the four development players, will have to make sure we've got cover for the the positions are effectively not so much short in, but probably light on in that make sure the four development players can play those positions uh, more than just give kids, not, not kids, but just have an opportunity for that players that might be yep. in positions that are strong for that next year. Um, the decisions were made. I think Rakia Horn um, is an outstanding signing for us. She's, you know, strong frame and played some heart NRLW. Um, the reasons, you know, unfortunately, we probably couldn't get Jess out of the Roosters. She's a, she wants to stay there. She's a Rooster girl. She lives in that area. Um, they do a lot of branding work with her. Um, so I, th I see, you know, our challenge is to make Rakia um, turn her, if she can be competitive, which we don't know yet, but train hard. Um, again, she's only very young into this Harvey Norman slash NRLW um, career of hers. Um, and then I'd like to think that we can, you know, with our coaching and development, she can effectively... You know, the goal might be to turn into someone like Isabella Kelly or Jess Surges over the next few years who are the premium centres at the moment. So, you know, the other thing that comes with Jess Surges is so does a lot of funds. Um, so if we go down that decision, um, it might have cost us one or two more of those other players that we're able to get hold of because of um, um, because Jess, you know, obviously elected to stay at the Roosters. Um, some great signings as we spoke about. Uh, 
local juniors, are we looking at signing any more local juniors like the Curtin sisters? Yeah, Curtin, both Curtin sisters will be part of our NRLW. Uh, they're a big part of our NRLW. Um, unfortunately, I haven't heard of knee on the weekend, so we've got to wait and see what that looks like, but I don't think it'll be too serious. But yeah, a- again, like we've obviously bought uh, Kezi, Sarah, um, Rakia, uh, might be one or two others that will announce. So there's five of our 24 players that will effectively not be local girls. The rest of the the, the other 19 to 20 players will be Harvey Norman players for the West Tigers and all local girls from both Campbelltown, um, Belmain and sort of MacArthur region. So. Which really validates that decision by the board yep. five years ago to invest funds yep. in yep. pathways instead of investing straight away into an NRLW licence. Yeah, that's right. And, and, you know, I think if you didn't have the development and the pathways, what you've got to do is you've got to go out and buy 25 people um, or 24 people or so. Um, you know, obviously there will be clubs that have partnerships with different areas to, to, to bolster their their own development. But as you said, you know, the, the, the junior division here in Western Sydney is quite large. Um, we now have had, this year have started Alicia Fiola program. We've, we've played the city diversion and the country version of Alicia Fiola. So, um, and then we've got Tasha Gar, we've got Harvey Norman, we've got the NRLW. So uh, I think for that development phase, it, it's like, you know, it's like, what has happened for a long, long time with the men is we've had Harold Matthews, SG Ball, JZ Flegg, then we go off the grade. Well, you know, we have now got that blueprint here for the women's program that we go Lisa Fiola, Tasha Gale, Harvey Norman, and then effectively you move into the, the grade, which is the NRLW. So, yeah. yeah, and they'll be all local girls. You know, the big thing for us is we want to push it. As I said, we want to be proud of where we come from. Those people have waited here for a number of years for hopefully a license to be granted to us. Um, they haven't gone elsewhere or they've gone and played, you know, NRLW. W to get experience, but I've always played Harvey Norman for us. So they're a lot of our passion. They're a lot of our pride. They'll create a lot of the culture um, and, and they love this club. So, you know, if we ask them, even Easter Monday, they trained here in the morning. They were asked to come out on the, to the stadium and sell some raffle tickets and do some things and be a part of the, These local girls are the ones that put their hand up first. So, mm. you know, they create a lot of that passion and culture for the football club. And then those marquee signings come in and get a feel of their passion, but then also bring the class. So it's a, I think it's a good combination. A couple of questions, not specific about the NRLW, but um, Robert Norris has said, can you see a bright future for the club given that being zero and six, that the morale amongst fans isn't that high at the moment? I think, I definitely think so, yeah. I think there's a lot of good people in this organisation. You know, I think when difficult times are approached, you know, I went through a great opportunity last year that you guys presented to me in the board and and through Tim to, to become the interim head coach. You know, I hadn't been around that level for a while. I hadn't even been around the NRL team most of the last year. Um, so to come in and be a part of that, I think you learn, I learn lots of good things about people in difficult times. And if they stand for the club and they want to be at the club and they go through difficult times and that the players, I think also who go through difficult times and put their hand up and stand up, well, they're the people that you want to get you out of difficult times and they'll enjoy the good times. Mm. You know, so I think life and football in my mind has taught me a lot about, you know, you go through a lot of really bad times in football and you back yourself and you train hard and you, you, you stay resilient and in the end it turns. Um, sometimes it's got to turn through business decisions and, and recruitments and, and bits and pieces. I know as a player, um, it turns very quickly your confidence. You can get one thing right on the footy field, you throw a decent pass, you make half a good tackle, you make a line break. Um, we've got very short-term memories. I think you've got to have as a footy player to get over it quickly. Um, the confidence and morale gets knocked around a little bit, I think, because you get asked questions every day when you're outside of here or when you come here, what's going on? So it's a bit, to not the warmest environment, but when you start winning, you, you run in with a step, people on the street are patting you on the back and you, your ego grows a little bit. Mm. So I, I think, you know, this club has great opportunity to have success. Um, you know, we've changed, you guys have made some huge business decisions the last 12 months in the direction. We've gone to the old direction, which is the new direction. Um, we've just got to be a little bit patient. I think some key signings were there. They don't become bad players because they just change clubs. It's just got to get combinations and partnership. And I know the people internally here that not a lot of people see work their backside off of this football club. So, yeah, I, I do see it having success. It might not be now. It might be in three weeks' time. It might be in six weeks' time. I want to be a part of this club for a long period of time and probably sit on the other side of the fence, not from the men's program, but sit on the women's program and make it a, a bloody successful women's program. Yeah, I'm a big believer that... Um uh, you can often judge one's character through adversity. Mm. And I think um, the true true character of people really shows, becomes to the forefront mm. when adversity hits people. Yeah. And I think there's some really strong people within this organisation that, as you said, are, are working really hard to do the right thing. 
um, and will continue to do so because they love the club and want it to be successful. Yeah. Uh, a um, young man who's been a member only for a couple of years, uh, Jordan, yep. he writes, what key learnings did you take away from coaching the NRL that you can apply to your current role? Yeah, it was a, a really exciting time that finished in a really challenging time. Um, learning curves are, um, you know, the thing I think really important is I get an opportunity to create my own program, bring bring my own people in, uh, have a style of footy that I want to play. Um, I think the other big thing you've got to have is you've got to create the relationship with the people and have their buy-in and their trust. And that comes from being a long time together, not just get handed the keys on a Tuesday and say, good luck this weekend. So, um, so it's, I, I think you know, the more you think about, about it, the, the harder an interim head coaching role is to come in and take over, especially when you're not a part of that assistant coaching role. I think it's, it's different from the outside coming in. Uh, it taught me to back myself and believe in what you trust and you believe and, and you, you believe it works, then you back it to the nth degree, which goes back to going through difficult times. You know, you just got to stay trustworthy that what you're doing is the right thing and the, the good times will come. So um, that was sort of the lessons I learned. Um, I had, had, you know, I love coaching. It, it, it never gave me the thought of never wanting to coach. It just gave me the opportunity to think about, you know, an NRL coach is extremely hard, life-consuming, a lot of work's got to go in it, a lot of good good luck and good fortune sometimes has to go in it well. Like, um, But, yeah, so I, I'd love to have another opportunity at, at some stage, but um, I'm not in a rush. I think now, not I was in a rush, but I think the fact that you've just got to do a really good long apprenticeship you know, learn more through coaching, be ready for when an opportunity comes. But And that's what I look at this NRLW program. You know, I would love to make it the most successful NRLW program there is um, and stay here for a long, long time and be a part of Pathways here and then see the fruits come at the end there mm. where we're successful with that, the NRL program through people that you've helped along the junior system. And then, you know, the, the I don't know how many games they'll effectively become with the NRLW if it becomes a full 20 round or 25 round or... You know, hopefully it becomes, you know, three state of origins and it becomes... I think that's certainly the plan. Yeah, so yeah. That, as that grows and grows and grows and it'll be a, an unbelievable thing to be a part of. Um, final one um, from Bo. So Bo's obviously gone onto social media and <laughs> sent, a, sent a question yeah. in, so thank you, Bo. Uh, when are you actually going to let your youngest join the girls on the field? I have my third daughter that is very, very keen to come and play rugby league, so... Um, we're in the process of having conversations about that. Um, cost me a lot of money for braces over the last few years, Justin. Mm, so I'm going through that. I'm now. going through that now. But um, no, she'll play. I, I can't say no um, to her to play. I've played. I love the game. Um, you know, I. Well, coach, she, do you want to be coached by dad? She doesn't listen to that very well, anyway. But um, but that'll yeah, change. That'll change yeah, from... yeah. But um, no, she was. She wanted to come out and be a part of the Lisa Fiola Development Day just to see what it's all about. So and what my four girls are there and my partner especially, is with, they're all super supportive of what I want to do in my job, but also they love rugby league. Like, it's been a part of their life since they were born. They've been around it, you know. As I said, I've been 13 years retired, but I've been in and around media or football clubs my whole life. They know people, they get on well, they, they, they like the social component of it. Um, so if you invite them to games, or they want a corporate hospitality box, not a grandstand. Yeah, no. <laughs> I've seen them there a few times. But, um, <laughs> no, nah, but yeah, they, they love football. Uh, they'll... They watch it. We sit down at home and watch it, you know. So um, effectively, I get paid to do something I absolutely love anyway. And then she'll play. Um, it's just a matter of where and when. And um, I'm not I, the one thing I am curious about is when she gets that first tackle. To, to, does an Oz tag tag leaguer want to want to play football after there's been the first collision? Mm. So we'll see what happens after that. The um, last week we had uh, two members events as well. Yeah. So we had a 10 year members event for 2000. 20, I think, and yeah. it was obviously delayed through COVID yeah. and then 2021, 10-year member event. So um, it was awesome to see everyone here. They had a tour of the facility yeah. and I know you were here when they were walking through and to see 170 members over the course of two days that have committed um, to this club yeah. over 10 years of, of um, passion um, and, you know, the ups and downs that go with any supporting any club. Yeah. It was awesome to see them and you must have been really proud to be part of this club as you saw them walking through last yeah. week. Uh, and I think that's what, you know, you can, the results are a big thing that we focus on and obviously everyone focuses on the NRL results, but that's what we get judged by and, and, and are looked at as a football club. But as you said, you see those people come through, they see the facility we've got, um, they put a smile on their face, they see those legends along the wall, which is part of that heritage um, opportunity and then um, they come in and, 
sit in and sit and eat and breathe where we would do it normally as a player. So I think that's what a great opportunity for public and, as you said, long-term members who have been through some highs and lows, um, and they're the members that, that you're back and you trust it. They're the guys that are going out to other people who are putting criticism on us or saying they're not going well. They're the people that stand up for you in the streets and go, hey, they are going well, they're doing this and that, only because they know the knowledge of what happens yeah. here behind the scenes. So, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. It's just everyone that walks through here, because it's open spaces and we all get to see everyone that visits the office, um, uh, you know, it's a very warm environment. The office, it's a friendly place. Where everyone laughs and gets on well. And, and as you said, the the one thing that we are always judged by is the, the the results now. And that you know, that's the one thing we'll always have to be re- judged on. But yeah, I got faith that's that's yeah. that's that's we're an NRL product. football we're club. We're an NRL yeah. football club, exactly. Yeah, but no, as you said, it's exciting to have people come through the facilities and see it. And uh, you know, I feel very honoured to be a part of West Tigers, and I'm so excited to be uh, our in inaugural NRLW coach. Well, Nadia, it's been a pleasure having you um, join us today for episode seven. I think the insight into what drives you and then also what strategically you're planning to do yeah. with this program. I think it's a very, really exciting time for the club, um, one that we've been sort of planning for five years. And um, I'm really thrilled that you've taken on the job and thrilled to have you here as a guest. Thank you, sir. A oh, pleasure, Thank Nadia. <laughs> and thanks, everyone, again for tuning in to Ask the Boss. Um, we do really appreciate not only the questions coming in, but also your support. Thank you.